May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We are in our journey in the letter of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we are taking it real slow because there is so much we can glean uh, from that short letter. And today we are at chapter 5 and verse 16. And you see the title on the screen, Be Joyful Always. And uh, honestly, when I read that, I said to myself, Paul, you've got to be kidding. Can we be joyful always? And then in Philippians, he actually repeated it. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, just in case you missed it the first time. Rejoice. So Paul was very consistent in what he said, uh, regardless of the church. And also you'll notice when Paul said rejoice in the Lord, uh, he's saying you can't rejoice in your circumstances. You can't rejoice in people. You can't rejoice in government. And you can't rejoice in material goods. Why? They can all be taken away from us overnight, in an instant. It can all be gone. So, we rejoice in the Lord. I want to break this down, take this word joy as it appears in the Bible, and break it down into four components. And uh, number one, and you're going to be shocked by this, the God of the Bible is a God of joy. The God of the Bible is the God of joy. In fact, the, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, if you explore each member of the Godhead, you are going to discover that they are joyful. And I'm going to show that to you, okay? First of all, the Father God. Father God. 1 Timothy 1.11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. That word blessed is the word joyful. In fact, uh, Phillips in his translation uses the word happy. So it's not wrong to say that the God of the Bible is the happy God. The happy God. The joyful God. Psalm 43 and verse 4. God, my joy and delight. God, my joy and delight. Zephaniah 317, if you really believe it, uh, it will knock you out cold. <laughs> Zephaniah 317. God will take great delight in you. He will rejoice over you with singing. Uh, I'm going to give you my paraphrase of this. God is so excited about you. He has composed a song about you and he's going to dance and sing it. Do you know that there's a verse like that in the Bible? Zephaniah 3.17. Right? Underline it in your Bible. And then Nehemiah 8.10, a verse that you probably should know. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So what empowers us? What motivates us? It's the joy of the Lord. So what do we mean by the joy of the Lord? This is a joy which God possesses and experiences. God the Father is the source of all joy. The first song that we sang, I wonder how many of you meditate on the words of all the songs that we sing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. One line goes like this. Giver of immortal gladness. You need to write that down. Giver of immortal gladness. Immortal means undying, forever, won't perish. So I gave you a few verses to prove that God the Father is joyful. He is the happy God. How about God the Son, the Son of God? So Luke chapter 10, verse 21. At that time, Jesus... Now underline the next three words, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. 
the Lord Jesus was a supremely joyful person. And that's why the common people were attracted to him. And that's true in real life, isn't it? Would you be attracted to a person who's depressed or joyful? You tell me. <laughs> you and I will run miles from somebody who is depressed. But you and I will polarize towards someone who is joyful. Now, we need to be very sensitive and compassionate towards those who are depressed. And that's another story for another day. But uh, Psalm 45 and verse 7. It's a messianic psalm talking about the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy. You know, in some circles, people love to use this word anointed. Anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He was anointed with the oil of joy. And he was anointed with grace. All that is in Psalm 40, uh, uh, 45. And I now pray for myself, Lord, today anoint me with the oil of joy. You know, your prayer language has got to change when you study the Bible. If you're a good student of the Bible, your, your prayer life, your prayer language has got to change. <laughs> and one of the things that you can learn to pray for yourself as I do it is this. Lord, anoint me today with the oil of joy. I don't know what I'm going to face today, but may I be anointed with the oil of joy. When I was driving and I saw all the gas prices, I shut my eyes and said, Lord, anoint me with the oil of joy. Right? And uh, John 15 and verse 11, talking about the Lord Jesus. These things I have spoken to you. By the way, these were words he spoke just before he went to the cross. That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be Tell me, what's the word? That's a very weak, full. Come on, you've got to get excited. If you're, you're, we're talking about joy. If you don't get excited, I won't get excited. Let's try that one more time. I have spoken these things to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be? Oh. Ah, that's far better. I saw Satan running out uh, when you shouted full. You know, Satan is very happy when you just say, Ooh. <laughs> come on, get excited, okay? Interact, interact. So, God the Father is the happy God. God the Son is supremely joyful. How about God the Holy Spirit? So, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. My goodness, that's going to disappoint a lot of you if your concept of heaven is eating and drinking, perpetual buffets. It's not eating and drinking. I'm not seeing it. Romans 14, 17. Okay? But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, we learned this in 1 Thessalonians 1.6. Just to refresh your memories, the Thessalonian uh, believers received the word in much tribulation. Now, watch the wording. With the joy of the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the word of God? Do you receive it with the joy of the Holy Spirit? So, the God of the Bible is the God of joy. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And J.B. Phillips said, the happy God. I love that. The happy God. Now we come to point B. The gospel is the gospel of joy. Gospel simply means good news. And look at the Christmas story. Luke 2.10, when the angels gave this announcement to the shepherds, look at the language. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for a few people. 
Okay, you're not following. Let's try that one more time. You all are looking at me, but you all are not uh, following. Let's try that one more time. Okay, so the longer you don't respond properly, you might be here till about three. Okay, that's the way I go, okay? Having, uh, sorry. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for? Good, now you are coming alive. Get that breakfast to work, okay? Uh, for all the people, Jew, Gentile, all the people, good news of great joy. That's why whenever you share the gospel, don't share it with a glum face. Because if you do that, people are not going to believe what you're sharing. Right? Now, 1 Peter 1.8. Here is another knockout verse. You know, in the Bible, there are knockout verses. It's almost like God giving us a punch. Boom! And we are knocked out flat. 1 Peter 1.8. You believe in him and are... Come on, let's try that again. You believe in him. It's all on the screen. You believe in him and are... And are filled... Filled to overflowing, filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Now, by the way, is that your testimony? I came to Christ, I trusted him as personal Lord and Savior, and I'm sad. Inexpressible means you can't put it into words. You can't describe this joy. It defies uh, language and logic inexpressible and glorious joy. So, uh, Brother Bak Singh, whom God used mightily all across India to plant over a thousand churches, coming from a Sikh background, uh, when he uh, wrote his testimony, he put it in a little booklet. And the title of that booklet was, How I Received Joy Inexpressible and Full of Glory. What a title to give for your testimony. Anyone would grab and read it because everyone wants to receive joy. Acts chapter 8, verse 8. Philip goes to enemy territory, Samaria, preaches the gospel, the good news, and people repent and turn to Christ. Now look at the result. So there was great joy in the city. So wherever the Lord Jesus Christ is presented and received, there will be great joy in that home and in that community, in that city. Now let's take a singular illustration. Same chapter, uh, Acts 8 and verse 39. The Ethiopian eunuch, all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship, he's returning empty and he's reading Isaiah 53. And the Holy Spirit guides Philip to join the chariot and to explain the passage. And the Ethiopian eunuch is uh, going to trust the Lord Jesus Christ for personal salvation. Now watch the result. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing, full of joy. And you can just imagine when he went back to Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, everyone said, eunuch, sir, minister of finance, what happened to you? You're full of joy. Your face is shining. I met the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how the gospel went to Ethiopia. And uh, Acts 13, 52. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit in the midst of severe persecution. They were filled with joy. So, beloved, when you and I embrace the gospel, the good news of Christ, one of the telltale signs is you're going to become a joyful person. Now, I'm not saying you won't have your trials and your tears. They will all be part and parcel of the package. But the joy will be permanent. And it will be a spillover joy. So, the God of the Bible is a God of joy. The gospel is a gospel of joy. And now we come to the main body of our sermon today, the grounds of joy. How can I become a person of joy? I'm going to give you 12 ways that we are going to become people of joy. 
you know, I wish some of you would be writing these points down because you can go home, you can process it, you can put this on Facebook, you can share it with some friends, right? Uh, so here we go. Number one, how do we receive joy? Joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. So when you and I come under the control of the Holy Spirit, right? How do we know that the Holy Spirit is active in your life? So there are some churches that would say you've got to speak in tongues. No. How do you know that the Holy Spirit is active in your life? You will become a joyful person. Even your dog will wonder what has happened to you. If you have a dog. Right? Your classmates are going to wonder, hey, what's, what's, what's with Joe? Something crazy is happening to this guy. Yeah, I am under the control of the Holy Spirit. So every single day, you and I need to pray, Spirit of God, control my life. Control my thoughts. Control my speech. Control my emotions. Control my affections. Control my actions. And when you come under the domain of the Holy Spirit, you are going to become a joyful person. That's the first uh, secret. Number two, the word of God. Now, that is why I'm so passionate about teaching the Bible. Because after you read the Bible and study the Bible, and if you are not joyful, something is wrong. If uh, you are reading the Bible and if the Bible is being taught and you're constantly looking at your watch or you're checking your uh, text message, something is radically wrong. Jeremiah ministered at a very difficult time. 40 years of ministry, zero converts. It's a very depressing book to read, Jeremiah. And there was a point at which Jeremiah said, what's the point, my being in ministry? I'm going to quit. I'm going to work at Tim Hortons. Okay? Now look at the change that came on Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15 and verse 16. When your words came, God in his mercy communicated with Jeremiah, spoke to him. The word of God came to him. I ate them. Will you please write the word meditation on top of it? Eight means he meditated. You know, for most of us, we just rush through Bible reading, isn't it? If we do read the Bible at all. I'm always appalled when I talk to Christians. Tell me something about your devotional life. Uh, thrice a week. Okay, how long? Uh, about five minutes. No wonder you're a, a, a spiritual pauper. No wonder you're a spiritual pauper. No wonder there's no excitement in your life. Right? I ate them means you read a passage, you reread it, right? You think about what you read, you twist and turn it over in your mind, you check meanings of words, and you ask the Holy Spirit to give you the meaning. You begin to journal. Uh, yesterday, uh, I, I had to bless two people on their birthdays. Uh, one was an older lady and the other was a delightful 16-year-old girl all the way in Bandaravela, Sri Lanka. I know her grandmom well and she said, Pastor, please bless my granddaughter. I said, sure. So we went on uh, WhatsApp and I uh, shared uh, with her a little bit. I said, uh, uh, do you read the Bible? I said, yes. She said, yes. I said, do you journal? She said, What's that? I said, do you journal? Uh, and then I had to explain to her what journaling is, right? Do you have a blank exercise book in your house? Yes. Start today on your birthday. What's the passage you read? Put it on top, date it, write something down. I'm going to check on you in a week to see how you are doing with regard to your journaling. So do you journal? Do you journal? If I come to your house, can you show me? Pastor, 2022, journal for three months. Now, don't tell me the dog ate it. 
That's why it's dangerous to have a dog. Okay? When your words came, I ate it means I devoured it, I digested it, it became part of my fabric, spiritual fabric. <laughs> now, how do you know you have meditated? Look at this verse very carefully. Look at the second part. They were my joy and my heart's delight. If you meditate on the word of God, and meditation is going to take time, you can't do it in five minutes, the end result is you are going to become supremely joyful. Right? <laughs> you know, when I was growing up, uh, as kids, whenever we uh, uh, did something that we shouldn't do, our parents would say, go to your room and read the Bible. <laughs> A good prescription, but the problem is we never did it. Because our parents knew that if you read the Bible, you're going to change. No point in the parents yelling and screaming at you, right? Let the book change you. Let the book change you. So number two, the word of God. Number three, the house of God. That's why I want to compliment you. You are here in person in the house of God. Now watch this verse. Okay, Psalm 122 verse 1. Uh, watch it very carefully, right? I was sad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Only one or two people caught it. Others, you know, sometimes you stare, but you're not really reading. Let's try that one more time. Correct me if I'm wrong. Loud, huh? Correct me loud. I was sad. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You know, uh, last Sunday evening, uh, I was speaking at a Brazilian church. Uh, standing room only, just packed wall to wall. And what I loved about the Brazilians is, uh, just like the West Indians, they are very expressive. You can't say one thing and boom, they are, they are, they are reacting, they are responding. And you have several of them having their cell phones in front of you and they are taping the whole message. I love the Brazilian church. Look, I fell in love. I said, Lord, I will be here anytime. <laughs> I got so, you know, and one full hour of uh, sermon and after that, the young people all stayed for another hour to ask questions. They didn't run to Tim Hortons. So the third way we become joyful is when we show up. When we show up at the house of God. Because that's where we meet with God in a very unique way. And that's where we meet with the people of God. That's where we have fellowship. That is where we uh, motivate one another. We challenge one another. We encourage one another. Right? So when we absent ourselves from Christian fellowship, we are not giving ourselves the opportunity to grow in joy. So that's why I compliment you today. You are here. Keep it up. Right? Keep it up. The house of God. Now here's the fourth way that we cultivate joy. Number four. Generosity in giving. Generosity in giving. So... Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is challenging the Corinthian church. They had made big promises, but they were not keeping it. And so Paul uses the Macedonian churches as an example. Philippian church is part of the Macedonian uh, area. They are overflowing joy, the Macedonian churches. They are overflowing joy. And they are extreme poverty. Their pocketbooks were empty. Hardly any money in the pocket welled up in rich generosity. You know, this uh, formula doesn't make any sense logically. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense logically. Uh, Paul could have just said generosity. He said rich generosity. So what made the Macedonian churches be joyful and be blessed by God 
because they are overflowing joy plus extreme poverty <coughs> equaled rich generosity. That is why, beloved, none of us can say, I can't give. And I'm honestly talking about money right now. Even students, even young people, we all have something to give. And when that is coupled with overflowing joy, it's going to result in rich generosity, meaning God is going to multiply it. God is going to multiply it. So if you want to be joyful, you and I need to release what we have. Of course, we have to save some money. I'm not against saving money. I encourage it. But we need to release what God has blessed us with for those who can't afford it. And right now, the Sri Lankan churches are suffering terribly. I can tell you that. Because Sunday night, we have about seven or eight pastors who join us in our study. And they give us a ground report. Ground report. And those who join us give money and say, Pastor, send it to them, to their people. Just basics. Not being able to buy medicines. Not being able to buy Tylenol. So, beloved, God has blessed us. Super abundantly blessed. We don't know what to do with our money. Overflowing joy plus extreme poverty equals rich generosity. That's the way our joy grows when we give sacrificially. Number five, how do we cultivate our joy? Serving God. Serving God. Luke 10, 17, the Lord Jesus selected 72, sent them in pairs, sent them on a mission trip. So they went on this mission trip and they are coming back to give a report. Right? That's, a, that's what you call accountability. Every time I go on a mission trip, I come back and I give an accountability report to different churches who have supported me uh, with pictures and with all the uh, money, accounting. The 72 returned with joy. So what does that mean? When you serve God, you are going to become joyful. Will you write in your notes... I don't want to be a spectator. I don't want to be a pew warmer. Very easy to do that, isn't it? We come, we warm the pew, we go, okay, next Sunday, let's see what happens. Don't be a spectator, right? Get into the action. Get involved. Start ministering to people. Start reaching out to people. And you'll find that your joy grows in an unbelievable way, serving God. Don't live a selfish life, you know, a clustered life. You know, you just build a little wall, a cocoon around yourself, and there you are. And you're not bothering about anyone out there. There are all kinds of people who are hurting, who are going through massive major problems, and uh, God wants us to reach out to them and bless them and to share our life with them. Sometimes a call might take you one hour. I sometimes have plans and all of a sudden I, I get interrupted by a call. <laughs> and sometimes a person doesn't even say, Pastor, is this a good time? Every time I call somebody, I say that, is this a good time? Yeah, yeah, it's a good time. Boom, they start. They go into, a, uh, uh, go into their problems. I said, yeah, just carry on. I, I'm going to listen to what you have got to say. That is serving God being a good listener, right? Serving God. Number six, how do we cultivate our joy? Number six, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Again, the Lord Jesus looked at these uh, uh, missionaries, <laughs> 72, and said, yeah, 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 demons left, all that is good and fine, but rejoice that you have been chosen by God, saved by grace, and your names are written in heaven. So that's another cause for rejoicing. That God has chosen you out of all the people in this world. And uh, he has drawn you to himself with the cords of love. 
and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We were all deeply shocked by uh, the death of uh, a cricketing legend. Uh, for those of you who are cricket lovers, you will know whom I'm referring to. 52 years of age, died of a massive sudden heart attack. And it was very interesting to read all the tributes that were coming in. And the one that caught my eye was what the current Australian captain wrote about uh, this uh, dead cricketing legend. Heaven is going to be a more lively place because the king has arrived. I put my head down and I said, from where did this guy get this kind of theology? He's saying that heaven is going to be a very lively place. Everyone is going to jump up and down because this dead cricketer, the king, has come. Blasphemy, utter blasphemy. That's the view people have of heaven. That's why you have to read the news, you know. When you read the news, you're going to be shocked by what happens out there. And it will help you to evangelize, right? Don't be like the ostrich, you know. You put your head in the soil and... Whatever happens out there, let it happen. Has Putin pressed the nuclear button? <laughs> no, you need to know what the news is so that you can become a good evangelist, right? Now, number seven. Number seven. How do we increase our joy? Future glory. So Peter writing to Christians who are suffering terribly in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says, a salvation to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Look at the two words. You are greatly rejoicing in what? Not in your persecution, but in the third tense of salvation. Past tense, the Lord Jesus died for us. Present tense, the Lord Jesus is sanctifying us. Future tense, the Lord is going to glorify us. He's going to give us a brand new body. And we are going to live with him for all eternity. We are going to live in heaven for all eternity. Future glory. So the more you think about heaven and future glory, we are destined for glory. Our joy is going to increase. In fact, Paul called all the trials of this life light momentary afflictions. Light momentary afflictions. And when you square it up with the future glory that is ours, it is going to make us supremely joyful. Now, number eight, how do we increase our joy? Sharing the gospel. And I can vouch for this. I'm an evangelist. I love to share the gospel wherever I go, whether people want to listen or not. <laughs> I will share the gospel. And one thing I've discovered, whenever you share the gospel, your heart is going to overflow with joy. Now, interestingly, I'm using an Old Testament passage, Psalm 126. It was read to you this morning. Now, again, watch it very carefully. Those who sow with tears, tears means a broken heart. I hold in my hand the key to this person's eternal destiny, heaven or hell, I hold the key. So I'm going with a broken heart. I don't know how they are going to respond. I go with a broken heart. They are going to reap with songs of joy. And then it's repeated. Those who go out weeping, you can't be an evangelist if you don't have a broken heart. Whenever people uh, follow my evangelism, Courses, the first thing I ask them is, do you have a broken heart? And I take a stethoscope and put it on the heart. And if I can't sense a broken heart, I said, sorry, go. This course is not for you. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow. What is the seed? The seed of the gospel. You are going as a farmer with the seed of the gospel. Seed of the gospel. And you're scattering the seed wherever you go, at your workplace, right? In the hospital, in your community. As you go for a party, you're scattering the seed. Today, after the service, I'm going to pray for a family who are headed to India. 
and I put together a lot of tracks and little booklets. And I, I'm going to give it to them and say, please, wherever you travel, God is going to give you opportunity to share the gospel. Here, give these to people. Don't tell me your bags are all overweight. You're going to share the gospel wherever you go, right? We'll return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. So when was the last time that you sowed the seed of the gospel in a person's heart? And it could be as simple as looking at a person and saying, God loves you. That's the seed of the gospel. Right? God wants to forgive all your sins. Seed of the gospel. God wants to give you the gift of eternal life. Seed of the gospel. Be the Lent season. And in a strange way, <laughs> there's a little bit more openness to spiritual things leading up to Easter. So use it. Use the opportunity. Wherever you go, open up a conversation. Now, with all my uh, cricketing friends, I have a wonderful door opener. Hey, Shane Vaughan, what do you think? And that is going to lead into a good discussion. Hey, that, what Pat Cummins said, that statement, do you agree with it? Those are door openers for the gospel. There you can sow the seed, right? So uh, number eight, our joy increases to the degree that we share the good news, right? Number nine, recounting what the Lord has done for us. We go back to Psalm 126. Psalm 126 is the people of God returning from 70 years of exile in Babylon. And uh, they are amazed at what God has done. God raised up Cyrus, uh, a king who didn't know God, <laughs> and used him uh, to help uh, expedite the process of the people going back to the land. Now watch what they say. Psalm 126 verses 2 and 3. Then it was said among the nations, underline the word nations, this is making a global impact. The exiles returning to the land is making a global impact. Nations. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. 70 years earlier, if you talk to them, you know what they said in Psalm 137? When the captors asked them to sing a song of Zion, when the captors said, hey, sing that song, Amazing Grace, they said, how oh, can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They had hung the guitar on trees. They had hung the piano on another tree. And they refused to sing. The song was gone. Now, 70 years later, refined, purified, chastened, cleansed, empowered. They are returning. And they are clapping. And they are dancing. And they are happy. And they are saying, look at the great things God has done for us. So what makes you joyful? When you think of the great things the Lord has done for you personally and for you as a family. Right? Now here is number 10. How do we increase our joy? Unity. Wherever there is division, there is going to be confusion, chaos, misery, sadness. Where there is unity, there is going to be joy. So Philippians 2.2, 2, Paul is telling the Philippian church, he's kind of detecting, detecting a little bit of disunity. Two ladies were fighting each other, right? So Paul was upset. And he's telling the church, Philippians 2.2, 2, make my joy complete, Philippian church, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Wow, what a definition of unity. So wherever there is unity, there is going to be joy. Right? And uh, Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. What a beautiful picture of paradise. Wherever there is a body of believers who are united to the Lord 
and united with each other. There is no bickering, no complaining, no griping, no murmuring. And there the Spirit of God descends and there the joy is made complete. So in a family, <laughs> just think of a family. If in a family there is no unity, there is no joy. If there is unity, there will be joy. Right? Now, number 11. The 11th secret of joy. Prayer. The Lord Jesus said in John 16, 24, Ask, and you will receive. Now, watch the second part. And your joy will be. Let's try that one, one more time. Ask, and you will receive. And your joy will be. So do we pray? And do we uh, have answers to prayer? Now the answer might not come in a way that you expected, but it's an answer nevertheless, right? And when the answer comes, you know what happens? Our joy is going to be made whole, complete. So if there is no joy, it may be that we don't pray. We don't pray believing. And we are not experiencing answers to prayer. So become a prayer warrior and your joy will increase. Now number 12, the 12th secret of joy. See the risen Christ with the eyes of faith. We are reading John chapter 20. The disciples are totally disheartened. Their master has died. All hopes lost. All dreams crushed. And the risen Christ appears. The disciples were overjoyed. That's an understatement. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Beloved, every time you come to the house of the Lord, you must see the risen Christ with the eyes of faith. And one place where the risen Christ reveals himself in a powerful way is at Holy Communion. At Holy Communion. Right? When you leave the sanctuary today, you should be able to say, I met the risen Christ. I saw him with the eyes of faith. And what will happen? You are going to be overjoyed. So these are 12 ways that you can cultivate your joy. Now I need to quickly add point D, guard your joy. You know why? There are joy killers waiting to sap your joy the moment you leave this door. There are joy killers. The joy killer could be someone in your house. The joy killer could be someone in your neighborhood. The joy killer could be someone in your school. There are joy killers all around us. So guard your joy. Don't let your guard down. Protect the joy that God has given you. I uh, like to close with a Sunday school song. <laughs> By the way, uh, we are going to sing a Christmas carol. Take a wild guess. What do you think it would be? Ah, joy to the world. How can you do a study on joy and not sing joy to the world? I know many of you have locked it up till Christmas. Right? You took the song and you have locked it up. Now we are pulling it out. Okay, but before that, this one. If you remember this song, I'm going to make a terrible effort at trying to sing this little chorus. Okay? Joy is the flag flown high from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart. Joy is the flag flown high from the castle of my heart, for the king is in residence there. So let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know, let the whole world know, let the whole world know. So let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know, for the king is in residence there. 
So is the king resident in your heart? And if so, you are going to be joyful. Lord, we thank you for Paul's admonition to us, be joyful always. Forgive us for the many times where we have lost this joy. And Lord, as we looked at the 12-step process by which we can cultivate and deepen this joy, I pray that you would help all of us, help me, to become a supremely joyful person because we have a happy God. Amen.